There we go. Awesome. Okay, let me see if we are live. Let us know if you guys can hear us and see us okay. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to At Your Studio. Um, let me see if, okay, I can see that we are live. All right, so if you guys can hear us and see us okay, drop a hi, hello in the chat. Let us know where you're viewing this live stream from. We have missed you so much. Um, and today I am with the one and only Steve Mitchell. You guys probably know him. Hey, oh, everyone. <laughs> there we go. All right. Audio is good. Hi from Texas, UK. Awesome. We've got lots of people from all across the globe, and I'm presuming we are going to be... Okay, the chat is blowing. Awesome. <laughs> so that's a good sign. Yeah. Um, wow. All right. So I think we can begin. So hello, hello, everybody. My name is Kathleen. I'll be your host for today's live demo as part of the launch of Steve Mitchell's course, Mastering Watercolor Landscape. So this is perfect for anyone who wants to upgrade their skills in landscape painting. Um, and you're going to be learning everything here from the basic landscape elements to how to put them all together. And for this live demo, Steve will give you a glimpse about what you're going to be learning from the whole course. So if that interests you, keep an eye on the chat because I'm going to be dropping the link to the course uh, later on. So uh, before we begin, I'm going to please direct your attention in the chat because that's where I'm going to be dropping the link to, well, a lot of things, including the inspiration image that we're going to be using today. Um, so when we say inspiration image, it's not the exact same image, but, um, well, Steve will talk about that later on. I'm, I'm going to reserve that for Steve. <laughs> um, but just to give you an idea, so while you are waiting for Steve to, Steve to get prepped and um, for me to talk, you can probably grab your watercolor materials with you, um, probably just a small watercolor sheet of paper, then that should be perfect. Uh, no pre-sketch needed. Um, this is going to be um, loose. And again, Steve will talk about what we're going to be doing in a while. And all the materials will be uh, are actually in the description of this video below, so you can quickly check that out. And stick till the end because I am, we are actually going to be giving away for everyone who is here in the live chat, um, a, an Etcher watercolor postcard. So this is um, an A6 size where it's, it's postcard and it's 300 GSM. So make sure you stick till the end because we are going to be doing a giveaway at the end of this live demo. So I'm pretty much excited for that for the winner as well. And but most um, most especially I'm excited for Steve to do his live demo. So a lot of All hellos right. already. Event. Without further ado, I'm going to hand the floor to Steve so that he can introduce himself and get us started. Steve, it's all you. Hey everyone, how are y'all doing out there? This is exciting, always fun to do a stream. Um, yeah, so uh, we're gonna do a little demo this morning and, uh, or I guess it's about noon. Uh, and I'll show you in a minute what I'm gonna be doing. I'm kicking off a class, it's a four class, uh, four session class on landscape and I, uh, sort of call it the elements of landscape. But the reason this, I feel like, helps you bring this class or course will help you bring your landscape skills to a new level is it really focuses on practicing individual elements separately because it's easier to focus on something like a tree or a rock or, or water or skies and then learn to put them together rather than painting full paintings all the time. Now we are gonna do a full painting today, but the focus of the course is studies. If you're familiar at all with my channel, you know that I'm big on studies because you make and cover a lot more training ground when you're doing studies and then put them together into paintings. So we're gonna, we have a class on skies, some simple skies and how to integrate those into the ground, how to think about them. We have a class, one whole class just on trees on trees and tree lines. And we have another class on various other ground forms, uh, how, how ground elements flow and fit together. And that will also include uh, some studies on doing rocks, underbrush, and water, uh, like still water reflections, uh, 
fast moving water, that sort of thing. And we'll end by putting all those together in a single painting. And we'll talk about how those, those elements go together. So that's the class. And today we'll just give you a little bit of a sample of what we're gonna be doing. So let me switch my camera to the easel, get started right away. This is what we'll paint today. Now this is uh, roughly the composition I'll try to use. This is actually pretty simple, but it's a good way to show you uh, some of the elements that we'll cover. Um, and a lot of times when I paint these, uh, they all they almost always turn out a little different. And I actually think that's a, a big plus in watercolor uh, because I like to let watercolor do its thing sometimes and then you react. You know, you may say, well, I put this there and it was supposed to be that, but unless you're painting something precise like a building, it doesn't really matter what you do is you react to what went down and then just adjust. So uh, perhaps as we're painting this, we'll, we'll be talking about that. We got a fairly simple mid horizon. Actually, I'm gonna paint the horizon a little lower. A sky, we'll, we'll do a simple sky, some uh, easy ground forms, a tree line and some individual trees. So a nice sampler. All right, and all I'll be using is uh, a flat and perhaps uh, one or two uh, different size rounds, depending on what I'm painting. That's really all you need for this. Uh, and I may get a rigger for some tree branches or some grass involved, possibly. Don't always have to, but I have it there if I need it. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with uh, the sky. And all I'm going to do is, is pre-wet this area. I have this. It's probably very difficult to see my pencil. Uh, this is just to guide me. But uh, I have a sort of a mountain line, line going here. And I'm just going to pre-wet this whole top part for the sky. We'll talk about colors as we use them. Just keep in mind that most colors, uh, especially if you paint in uh, muted tones, you know, not real bright kaleidoscopic colors, are going to be complex mixes. But I, I have a 10 color palette here, so I don't have a lot of colors, but of these 10, I'm probably only going to be using about six, maybe seven. Now, I'm on a bit of an incline, and that's really just for video purposes. When you paint a sky, you may well want to paint that flat. I'm used to kind of catching any downflow here with a corner of a paper towel. Uh, but if that's new to you, that may be a little bit distracting to have to worry about the beads of, of color. Now, some people like to paint on an angle, and they like the downward especially if they're doing full washes. And doing a full background wash would be another way you can approach this. But for this painting, I'm just going to uh, wet the top part, the sky, down to where this distant mountain range is, or hills. These, you see me going over this several times because... I like to make sure that it's saturated. And this is 140 pound cold press cotton paper, 100% cotton paper. I always recommend that. Non-cotton paper does not handle wet washes very well. And you will notice that if you spend any time painting with paper that isn't cotton. It's doable. I mean, you can, can do it, but your results will be much better. All right. Now, you can probably see my palette, and I've got a uh, palette, what they call palette dirt or palette residue. I like to keep that because sometimes it's a shortcut to, you know, sort of making my colors a little uh, less 
vibrant or more natural. So I'm bringing out some ultramarine blue. It's really the only blue on this palette, but you can do a lot with it. And uh, there was actually some dirtier green on here. I'm going to go ahead and use that so it's going to turn out into almost kind of a cerulean sort of a grade. But the base color is that I'm using is uh, ultramarine blue. Now, and one of the things we'll talk about in the class is, is how to keep your skies simple. Now, there is such a thing as what I call a cloudscape, and that's where the clouds would be the major feature, the major actor in your painting. But in a lot of the paintings I do, you don't need much, and it's easy to overdo a sky. So what I like to do is just a few simple wisps. And I gotta again catch that bead before it gets away from me. Just a corner of a paper towel is all you need if you're on an angle. That's gonna be quite light, so let me pull in just a little bit. Darker color. I'm, I'm really in this sky. I'm not worried about a lot of clouds or anything. I don't want anything to distract from what landscape I'll be painting. I just want some color and a little variability up there. Some nice little wispiness. And hopefully you'll notice that I am not fussing with the sky much. That's a sure way to make it look worked, overworked. Steve, are you yeah. dropping the darker blues in the middle of the first ones or i did a bit yeah yeah I did. um but all of this spreads pretty as wet as that background is and that sky area is and uh really i'm trying to decide here if i want to connect i think i do some of these blue shapes what's left uh, what i'm thinking here as i drop in this blue is that sky and what's left would be clouds so it's sort of a form of negative painting. And uh, all I did here is I just went and connected some of those because they looked a little bit disjointed. But uh, the whole time I'm thinking backdrop to what's going to go in front. I don't want it to be super distracting. Don't want it to, to make the painting busy. I'm continuing to mop this edge because I'm going to, next we're going to handle this distant hill line and we'll paint several things together that will join in a wet and wet fashion, but I don't want it to creep into the sky too much. And right now, anything I paint there that touches that will do that. It will bleed up into the sky. Now, some of that's fine. Um because you may want sort of a, in fact, uh, on this one, as I let that dry, that did that, you see how soft that is. And this, and then we left some of this here, so it looks like a misty hill. And I do want to do some of that. I don't necessarily want a crisp, you might want a crisp, sharp hill line, but I didn't. I wanted something soft and receding. And I could wait till that whole thing really dries, but I don't think I'm going to do that. I think what I'm going to do instead is, hold on just a second, just try to keep this edge dry enough so that it doesn't 
bleed too much. All right, I'm picking up a number 10 round. Actually, I'm going to go to the bigger one. This, I think, this doesn't have a number on it. I think this is a four, 12 or a 14. So I'm just going to add, now I have uh, phthalo green here. Um, and phthalo green is extremely strong. I don't want it too strong, but since it's a distant hill line, I want it kind of a blue green. I'm going to touch that sky just to see how soft that's going to be. A little bit soft, doesn't look too bad. Now, this is the part, the part where you kind of have to work fast, and you've got to pay attention to several things. Um, you got to pay attention not only to the edge you're creating, but the edge you're leaving below. So a lot of times what I will do, it just takes a lot of, of water and brush management, is uh, where I know other colors are going to come in, I'll just soften it. And that uh, sort of leaves me open to what comes next. Or I'll, I'll sort of, you know, maybe even dry brush out that edge. And then I'll just kind of work these hills till I get sort of the value that I want. And again, with edges, what you're concerned about is do you want a hard or a soft edge? And what's going to be the next thing that comes and dovetails with that edge? And that gets into putting these things together. So you may have to think about a lot of that. And with this being rough and dry brush like that, that's going to look, when I uh, go over that, layer over that with another color, that's going to look pretty natural. It's rather than one hard, crisp, straight, or uh, defined line. Now I'm taking that same color. Again, it's that sort of grayed ultramarine that we used in the sky with a little phthalo green added to it. And since I like that misty effect that I had on the other piece, I am going to clean out my brush and soften the bottom edge. So now, uh, and I, I want to make sure there's no line anywhere down here. And checking my edges where what I want. I think I want to make sure there's no hard edge here. The way to do that is with a damp but fairly dry brush. And the way, you know, you... You need to be able to change the moisture level in your brush quickly. And one way to dry it, not dry it, but take all that out, is to put it in a rag and squeeze real hard. And now you can uh, dry soften an edge like that. All right, so I've got over here some Indian yellow already out. And I have back here an Azo Green. This is an M-Gram color. Uh, and, a lot, and most other brands, they call it Green Gold. So we're going to start popping in some of these other colors. This part, and down through this foreground here, is something I do fairly spontaneously. And that's why these uh, turn out different. Because I let the watercolor... Kind of do its thing and where we have white here um, that's going to be a much brighter value and that's what i want but i'm also considering how i'm leaving edges and 
And as we come up here in front of this tree line, I might have should have softened that edge a bit from before that distant mountain, but we'll we'll make it work. We'll make it part of the <laughs> we'll make it part of the scene. Steve, there's a quick question in the chat, yeah. which yeah. I think might be interesting for you to answer. Um, sure. Uh, why do you only have one blue, uh, ultramarine blue, in your palette? Is there any reason for that? It's just uh, a limited palette that I like to use. Um, I, I won't say there's a specific reason for it, but uh, I like to paint with limited palettes. I feel like um, most color mixing is much more interesting and variable when you force yourself to mix than if you use a lot of convenience colors. Convenience colors can quickly turn your painting into something that's like, uh, if you're not careful, I'm not saying it, it absolutely will, into something that's a little, what, what I, I'm struggling for a word, but uh, not as interesting, <laughs> okay. So I like to I like to mix. Uh, I just feel like this variegation that takes place uh, is more forced upon you. It becomes a habit after a while. I have nothing against other blues, so don't get me wrong. Uh, I have other palettes with more colors. Uh, cerulean blues. I love cerulean blues, um, especially for skies. I love cobalt blues. I even thalo blue. So they have their place, but uh, it's a good practice. Um, just to force yourselves uh, to mix in certain painting situations. Um, just to, to achieve some variety, some interest. That's true. It's always beautiful when you make your own colors yeah. or mix your own colors. You can. Um, no, go, go right ahead. Sorry. Uh, do you, oh, after you, um, this part probably, um, would you mind giving us like a quick rundown of the colors that you have for your limited sure. palette? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I have uh, ultramarine blue, as we've already talked about, and you've already seen me use thalo green and the azo green, which again, in most brands, that's a, a green gold. And I'm going to keep working because this is, is, uh, wet and I need to work on this while it's wet. I also have an Azo yellow, an Indian yellow, uh, a pure all scarlet, uh, it's a good orange red. And I probably will not use that today. And let's see, dioxazine purple, a quinacridone rose, which is a very uh, cool red. Uh, my earth tone is Red iron oxide, and I can make a variety of earth tones from cool ones to brown ones, brown ones, cool ones to warm ones like red ones, reddish to ochreish. Just just with red iron oxide, you actually uh, again. I have nothing against earth tones. There's some great ones out there. Uh, red iron oxide is probably closest to burnt sienna which you may be more familiar with. I like red iron oxide better. It's, it's more vibrant, more transparent. Um, and then finally uh, up here is neutral tint, which is just a gray. It will gray and darken any color without changing its hue. And I'm using quite a lot of uh, palette dirt here. Um, you, a lot of these grayer, browner colors are just created by complements. So uh, I could put out a thalo green again, which is extremely vibrant, and just get up here into this quinacridone rose, and it'll immediately start graying it. Or I could go to the neutral tint and gray it. It's just a mistaken idea that you need a lot of colors, you know, to start. And then you, you're more advanced and going to do better if you have a lot of colors. Actually, the 
the opposite is true. Usually the more advanced painters I see are using, not always, so I don't want to, you know, offend anybody, but, uh, or you'll find that the painters with a lot of experience, a lot of times are using 10 to 12 color palettes. And I even see some of them using uh, a split primary palette, which is about six colors. And see, I'm, I'm just trying right now to gray out some of these brilliant, this uh, yellow gold in here was a little too bright. Also, uh, you may notice that I'm keeping everything fairly middle value. We'll come back then with another pass that will add darker colors. And, and what I've done through here is not only tried to maintain some interesting variation in the tones. I mean, it looks like I used five different colors in there, and I used two, three. But I'm also trying to... Uh, lay the groundwork for some uh, contrast because I'm going to be creating some hard and distinct edges. So I put, if I put red iron oxide, that, that red brown up here into some of this green, it not only warms it up, but it also uh, de-intensifies it a bit because it's a red. It's reddish and red is the complement of green. So I'm, I'm, again, setting some soft uh, groundwork for contrast. Now, these, these white areas, I'm going to leave those. Those are nice reflections, like maybe this is sort of a swampy section up near the, the shore. And they just add some really interesting shapes and... Uh, contrast and we'll come back again with uh, some more distinct darker colors that is still such a vibrant yellow there and that's fine what I'm going to do now is wet lift a little bit uh, and that's just uh, a damp brush but uh, the paint has not dried and so you can brush it a little bit with the damp brush and I'm doing that to lift and then squeezing my brush tight so it's even drier so I can pick up again I'm setting a foundation for some contrast and some edges. And I think I've got some pretty nice variegation going on here. I'm going to, in this uh, middle tone layer, I'm going to move on down the shoreline here. We're going to make these uh, grasses and all down here a little bit more earthy. Don't want to get them dark yet, though. So it's sort of uh, like pre-wetting, but only with color. So I'm going to go ahead and paint out my shape. Let's see. A little red iron oxide. Mixed into that green. And uh, if you're doing this, uh, all of this uh, needs to stay light. You, you want to make sure you give yourself some latitude of value. One mistake I see a lot is just to get too dark in your first washes. And then you haven't left yourself, you know, any room. And when you darken it, um, everything looks flat. And it should, at this stage, it should look flat because we haven't gotten to shadows yet. 
Steve, we noticed um, your brush strokes are becoming different um, with the different landscape elements that you're painting. Um, someone's asking in the chat, can you pretty much talk about the brushes and uh, what you can do? Uh, I'm just going to read it aloud. Hold on. Can you riff on the brush? Uh, you have some of the best explanations of what brushes can do via the paint uh, and water and how you load the brush, etc. Mm hmm. Well, um, yeah, I, I'm just fitting the brush to whatever I'm, I'm painting. Now, this right here, even though it's a pretty big round, it's got a nice point. So it's allowing me to quickly fill, uh, but also uh, get down with the point. And that's that's great. You know, I probably even should, could switch to the smaller one. Um, the, you know, the the brush it, it's it's really just trying to to how do I put it um, match your the the feel that you want. You know, or or a, a lot of times. Uh, in watercolor, two smaller brushes chosen. So if I'd have done any of this with a small brush, it would have been patchy, would have looked a little more disjointed. It would probably have started drying out in, in areas before I could, uh, you know, do the wet and wet charges that I want. So a, a larger brush to put in these flat colors is really important because it allows you to cover a lot of ground quickly. But if you need to like bring it down uh, to a point detail, you can. Now, as we get into more drier painting and we let all this dry, uh, we will go to a smaller brush because we won't be filling such areas. I'm not sure if that's really answering uh, your question or not, but. Let us know if um, we have answered your question. Um, and to those to the newcomers, uh, feel free to type any of your questions in the chat. Um, I have the authorization from Steve to interrupt him at any time. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's right. So, yeah. That's what it's all about. Right now, all of these foreground, well, pretty much up to here, from here down, all of these these foreground shapes are are wet so i'm going to do charging if you're not familiar with that term that just means uh, a tap in of color wet and wet and you see what happens when you tap in color wet and wet it it eases in bleeds in that's called charging so just a wet and wet painting um and it just helps me to mold the shapes one of the things we'll talk about in the class is how these uh, these are not flat paper cutouts. These these are landforms that that do this. You know they roll and so uh, and shadows very important concept. Shadows in watercolor, well shadows in landscape uh, sink to the bottom of everything. It, it's actually pretty amazing. The more you start looking at it, the more you you see it. So as you paint shapes, you know you know well I need some shadow down near the bottom of that. You don't want to draw distinct lines, but you know, you want to start shading in interesting ways. And that's a that's a bit dry up there, so if you want soft shadows, you can do that while it's wet. I'm actually trying to use a little less green than I used in this one. Now we're into fall. I, I'm here in South Carolina, so our fall is looking half reds and oranges and half greens because it's not everything has changed yet to autumn color. It's lovely that you've made different versions of this um, landscape picture in your head. So when you put them all together, it's kind of like a different seasons. Yeah. <laughs> be like, yeah. Oh, like already. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a little it's a little hard to actually paint um, 
in summery greens when you're staring out the window and you see all these oranges and beautiful reds and stuff. <laughs> you think, oh, I want to paint that. Yeah. Is that when you use the pyro scarlet? Yeah, pyro scarlet is just right. It would be a great autumn color uh, mixed with some of the red iron oxide. Um, in winter and more wintry landscapes, I would use uh, this up here. This dioxazine purple is actually a very important color to me um, because if you ever look at winter woods, you know, where there's no the leaves or foliage deep into there, you will definitely see a, not only it, all the trees are gray, but you'll also see a very um, purplish cast. And purple also uh, is a great way to enhance greens, yellows, it, it grays yellows in interesting, neat ways. And this is, again, just getting into where I say mixing is so much more interesting, more important than using a lot of colors. I actually recommend that people don't use a lot of colors until they have a, a more experience because there's also a very, uh, very much an indecision that goes along with a lot of colors. And so you you can be overwhelmed when you're painting. If you have uh, 24 or 48 colors, you're like, oh, man color do I use now? Uh, if you're and mixing not only makes uh, your pieces more interesting, it, it makes uh, you more familiar with your color. And it, even if you should decide that you want a lot of colors just because you love to collect color and there are people like that and I, I have no problem with that. I'm one of those people. Um, I have hundreds of tubes of paint and I have probably 20 different palettes. But even if you do that, you want at least one or two palettes that you know in your sleep. You know, you could go to a color, you, you know what it'll do, you know, with hardly even thinking about it. I mean, you want to get to that point at least. You want to work towards that. I think. That's, that's my advice anyway. It's actually a great advice. Um, and I think it's it's um, pretty much a lesson for most uh, artists and beginners out there who would like to get them all because it's easy for you to be tempted with all of these lovely colors. So that might be a challenge for us, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, if if you if you love color, you just love celebrating and collecting color. Do that, but. When you set up your palette, set up uh, set up a few at least. Um, I'm going to dip into this purple for the first time just because I want to kill some of this yellow. That's a compliment of yellow. I'm putting in another little land piece down here to balance out composition. Go ahead and collect all those colors. If, if you have the money and, and the love, collect hundreds of them if you want. But set up some palettes, you know, which only have no more than 12. And get to know those palettes really, really, really well. Paint with them. Paint with them and learn how to mix with them. You know, once you do that, then take some of your other hundreds of colors, if that's what you want to do, and, and set up another palette. I will say that decorative painters might be an exception to that rule. There are a lot of decorative painters out there. and They paint more in a you know, a, a solid flat color and uh, everything I'm telling you is opinion. Okay. You can go out there and prove me wrong on all of it if you want to, but that's my advice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I think uh, we heard back from the question earlier about the brush works. Yeah. So um, I think she wanted to hear about how a brush works. For example, how do you pick up water? How you get the balance of water paint and keep the paint value and consistency even? So pretty much how you load your brush. Yeah. Way. Well, you're probably not going to like my answer. And that's practice. 
Um, it really takes just a lot of doing that. Um, and I, I, you make your practice uh, very directed. I mean, may, basically you're saying to yourself, this is what I'm going to practice. I'm going to practice changing the moisture. I actually have over here, let me point the camera over there just real quick. You see that big fat sponge? That's a car wash sponge. And then mm -hmm. below that I have a towel. And then down here, I've got paper towel and I've got a rag sitting in my lap, okay? The rag sitting in my lap, I hold in my hand. So uh, you want to, and the water up here are, are two things of water, one for washing out the brush and one for grabbing some clear water. But you want to be able to, to grab water, uh, decide on a brush, that will dispense the right amount of water for you. There's no way to tell you what that is, except that you have to, to do it and try it and just become familiar with it and be able to take out that amount of water. Uh, sometimes, and the reason I hold this one in my hand is sometimes it's just a quick swipe just because I've noticed my brush is a little too wet. Um, you see my brush is fairly dry now. This is all wet right here. Um, I could take this dry brush and see what it's doing. It's picking up some of that. Use those things. Use those things. Um, if I were to add water to this, because this wash is starting to dry, I'd get a bloom. So the only way to know those things is to experiment. I've got stacks of scrap papers where I've done that. I just experimented. Um, there are no, there's no rules or set of instructions that are definitive for every brush and every situation. It's just, it's a feel, um, when you're dealing with pigment and concentration, uh, you get to know it. Just, uh, what I, what I recommend is going in, uh, adding a color and painting i'll show you what i mean it's an exercise I, I recommend all the time painting a dark square maybe the darkest square you can get learning how to to dilute that and make a value scale and uh, in fact in one class i taught we did that then make the next value scale how much water did I add to my brush? Well, you have to experiment till you can do that. Wash a little pigment out. What I do is I usually make a five, six, seven step value scale till I'm down to, you know, just a wisp of color like this. And, and see, I'm going over here and tapping on this towel. Then I'll turn around and go the other direction and darken it till I get back to the darkest. That's an exercise you should practice and practice and practice. Just like with blending. Blending is another exercise you should practice. It's a, it's a fundamental. Uh, pigment to water ratio is a fundamental skill you need to learn. And the only way to do that is just to, to practice it. I hope that. I really hope that helps. It's not discouraging. Sure does. Yeah. Um, and I think you guys will get to... Have a lot of opportunity to practice in Steve's course as well. So lots yeah, of exercise yeah. for you. <laughs> um, quick question about the shadows. Are you using the uh, dioxazine violet and red iron oxide for the shadows? Like these ones I put in here? Mm -hmm. um, that was actually some... Uh, that was actually red iron oxide and a little bit of um, ultramarine blue. So uh, red iron oxide is a red orange. And so when you combine it with ultramarine blue, uh, you get almost like a Payne's gray or a gray. So it's sort of a, I had a, probably a little more red iron oxide. So it's sort of a, a reddish brown, but gray shadow. Yeah. So See? one thing you'll find with mixing as you, as you become competent and confident with combining colors because everything is a push it's like 
I do a lot of visual mixing. So I'll put something down on the, either the palette or even on the paper. And uh, I start nudging. I start nudging it this way. Much as a sculptor would take a rough lump of clay, you know, roughly push in the eyes and roughly pull out the nose and say, no, that's not quite right. I need to push in a little bit more. And then uh, that's color mixing. Color mixing is very much like uh, adjusting. And I don't, there's there's no recipe. You know, people do all these color charts, uh, which is great for exploration. But when you're in the moment painting, color chart doesn't really help you because you look at the color chart and you, you won't remember how much of what you use, you know, to mix something. So you, you, it's not that it's not as complicated as that. It's actually just getting your color out, like put out this really bright yellow. And of course, I had some residue on here, which I went ahead and used to make it browner. I like to use whatever's out here, and I say, okay, that that. I don't know how I got there exactly, but I've got almost a yellow ochre. <laughs> I hate to make it so sound so unscientific. And I said, well, let's, I want that redder. So, uh, but it's still earthy. So let's do a little bit of red iron oxide. Now it looks kind of like a, a raw sienna, which is a little darker. And, you know, you just keep pushing and nudging. That's color mixing. And uh, after a while, you know, you're more precise and, and, quick and definite about how you nudge your colors in which way. Color theory and color mixing, uh, a lot of times is just made to be, or sound anyway, much more complicated than it is. All right, I'm very, a lot of this is, I think the first layer is done and I'm tempted to start detailing, but really I need to work on this area up here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start uh, making distinct shapes out of these trees and whatnot. And let's first mix up uh, what would be some of these fir trees or spruce type trees. And that's just a grade. That's just simply a grade phthalo green. This is phthalo green. Way too bright as it is. I'll just grab a little bit of Neutral tint. And we got a nice little kind of a spruce color there. That's a foresty green. It's not nearly so bright. However, I want to start a little bit fainter. So I'm going to brush in my tree shapes. can kind of use a, if any of you are Bob Ross fans, you can kind of use a Bob, Bob Ross approach. It's just like a, a back and forth, kind of an irregular zigzag. If you ever watch Bob Ross, he does it with a fan brush. And I try to make it look naturally irregular, not so much like a Christmas tree. And I'm going to come right down into here because I want to make that tuck behind. We'll create an edge there. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. So we'll come right down in through here. And I'm just going to tap right up the center. Just, that's sort of its trunk, but we'll probably strengthen that in a minute. I actually need to switch. One, one mistake I make is I, I get lazy about switching brushes when a smaller brush will do. I like how you said you're just tapping for the trunk and not like drawing a straight line, yeah. which we normally do. Any reason for right. that? Or is it well, you, you know, the, the trunk, you really can't see except maybe in places and I'll go back probably with a little shadow here and there when we get to the detail phase. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, if you, if you really want to paint good trees, you just need to spend a lot of time observing and in the center 
all of this is just denser and darker. So you're not necessarily even seeing the trunk, but you're seeing, you know, where the branches, and then of course it gets sparser as you get out here, especially on these, these fir trees. I'm going to make one a little more raggedy over here. I don't want it to look like a Christmas tree. Make this one bigger. And it's okay because these things, uh, to for them to look like they join because they, they kind of smash up against each other. And I'm just uh, negative painting down here where I want my edge to look natural. What, and what that is, is like, I'm not just creating an edge for the bottom of the trees. I am determining what the edge of this, whatever this shape is going to be. So you have to always think about not only the shape you're creating, but the shape that's coming next to it. All right, we got a basic shape there. Let's uh, get some some more of that green. Let's bring in a lot of this sort of ochre yellow. Actually, I'll just mix it right there. Color mixing, uh, you know, I use the sculpting analogy, but it's just really um, opportunistic. You know, you see what's there on your, your palette and you add to it or take away from it or you start over. So that's perhaps another way to characterize it. I'm going to start creating some edges. Let's make a deeper green. Part here. I'm going to so that's green. Let's add a little bit of red to that so it's a little grayer yet. And I'm going to wash out my brush and soften some of that. I don't necessarily want all of this to be this hard stipple. or necessarily all to be the same value exactly. And you can blend it out. Go ahead and connect all that. So we can do a lot of that. I'm going to come over here and just sort of have a little miniature side tree scrubs over here. I already have a shape there, so... You'll notice you start putting these in and it pushes that mountain or hill back. I wanted to highlight that uh, where you try to decide where to put the trees. Someone's asking, how do you decide where uh, to put your darker trees or how do you decide your composition, which goes where? Yeah, that's, that's uh, fairly uh personal and intuitive by personal i mean uh, it's it's like i said where you know wherever you want it to go really it's balance for me it's balance if that helps you um 
I like sort of an asymmetrical balance. Uh, I would not want, for instance, what I call picket fence trees, where it's like, don't, 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 don't. don't. So I've got this. I, I feel like that's balanced. I'm going to be adding more over here. So this, this side's going to be a little bit more heavily weighted. And by the time I get done, uh, I'm probably going to have, especially if you look at this one, I have a center of interest that's like right in here. So what you have is is detail and emphasis, weight of emphasis decreases as you get away from, or it should decrease as you get away from your center of interest. That might be the best way to put it. And, you know, I like having, if this wasn't here, and I know when I painted this, it looked blank and empty. So I filled it, you know. And over here, I liked uh, communicating some distance. So I made these trees on a smaller scale, but it also seemed to balance um, without wrecking my center of interest. Uh, this here was put because this whole area was looking empty. So I'm using that as sort of a study for this piece. Um, it, it, you're, you can base your decisions on several things. There's, there, don't look for a rule. You know, don't look for a rule because where rules Compositional rules will work with one thing. It may not work with another. But learn why. The best thing is just to learn why. Uh, so, you know, in that sense, your, your question is good. It, it's like, well, what's your why? You know, why would you put something there? Um, is it just to fill space? Uh, is it to make it more interesting? Does it make it busier? Does it really add? And composition is something that you learn over time, just like anything else. But you become more con uh, confident with it. See, this is not in the original one that I'm I'm kind of going off of. But I just felt like I had a nice little edge started there, a contrast. So I want to take advantage. And now I've got. Not only did I put that in, but now I've created, automatically created the edge for this foliage down here. So that's cool. I like that. So really, all I can all I can say is why I put that tree there. Oh, and it may not be the same reason I put a tree over here. Hope that's making sense. Absolutely, it does. I think it, it does make absolute sense. Um, and while we're at it, um, in the topic of composition, I guess, let's talk about balance. Uh, somebody's bringing, uh, a lot of people have been bringing up balance, how to keep it in check. Um, and I think one of the things you're keeping in check here would be contrasts, like contrasts of warm and cool yes. tones. Is that right? Uh, how do you keep those in check when, while you're painting, I guess, to achieve that balance code and code yeah it, um just uh, it's constant assessment you know it's very easy to get myopic you know tunnel vision when you're painting and not see what's happening with the composition so um you know you, you have to just stop and think what am i doing and why and you know if I add something here, what will it do? Like I wanted to put a tree here, um, but I didn't want it to be the same color. You know, maybe this is uh, an autumn tree. I know fir trees don't change color, but hey, you know, it's my painting. I can do what I want to. Um, but it looks good color-wise, and I liked it in this painting. I liked having another tree here with color, so I'm doing it. Uh, it adds more subtle balance. So I've got something offsetting these these bigger trees, but more subtly. So you can all, you know, balance, you can always think of uh, balance in degrees. You know, it's like, it's not always a, a, a seesaw extreme to one or the other. Sometimes it's just slight change in balance this way, slight change in balance that way. And I'm going to get a smaller brush now because I want to put in these uh, more distant fir trees. 
And I think I'm going to make them fainter than uh, the example piece I've been showing y'all. Now, when distance, uh, a very, very important concept. And the only way to really uh, understand and know this is to, just to do a lot of sketching and, and observing. The most important thing in describing distance is scale. Scale, uh, you know, I don't want these trees to have or appear to have as big and chunky a boughs as, as those. And the other thing is color. You know, farther away elements are going to be uh, bluer and less contrast. So I'm, I'm trying to get a little more detailed. I want to make sure that I have scaled these shapes down so they look like they're further away. I'm going to Can even come in front of that one with a darker one just so they don't you know look like they're lined up in a line and again uh, just to repeat a concept i've already been talking about is i got to be concerned with this edge up here um, so i want to make sure that um, I'm rendering that. I'm doing something with the negative painting behind it that it, it leaves it looking natural and uh, usable. You really just uh, need to do a lot of sketching of trees from, from life, from observation. Trees seem like a really easy subject to do, and they are, but uh, you can get into a very generic practice of, of painting and drawing trees if you're not careful. The trees have so much character. If you've been around my channel long, you know how much I love trees. Uh, trees, you can literally paint portraits of trees, and you could paint trees the rest of your life and never paint and that, you know two trees that looked alike it might look similar but i'm gonna merge this bit of a tree here down into some underbrush foreground detail or mid-ground detail blend out some of that so it's not so harsh oh nice little almost like an island of trees isn't it maybe a different color here run off the edge got a bit of a line there i don't want but that's all right it's not bad i've got a big sort of blank area and i don't really mind that so much because you know with areas of detail and this this will kind of uh, point back to the question someone asked about balance how do you determine another one is uh there are all kinds of contrasts. There's, of course, the most obvious is value contrast, you know, dark versus light. But there's also detail contrast. You want areas that are calm. You want areas that are busy and detailed, but you want that offset by areas that are calm. You know, you don't want it so empty that it looks like a mistake. But um, I've got a nice little area of calm here. And I, 
So I'm not going to detail all of it. Maybe I'll put just in a little bit of subtle um, foliage action ha happening right there. Just so it's not all too soft. Blend it out as it gets further away. I like the light value in this area, and I like uh, the fact that it's not so... I like that it's connected to... It connects all the way around, but I also like the fact that it's not too busy. So there's some, some subtlety happening there. All right. How are we doing on time, Kathleen? We're just down an hour probably, um, which is okay, because I think we are enjoying the show. People right, are well, quiet <laughs> in the chat, yeah. Let me, I, I definitely wanted to get to the reflections. Because um, sure. there, there will be some more shadows here, and I think we can add those pretty quickly. But what I'm going to do here, and... Uh, let's, let me pull out this reference image again. I want to leave all of this white. Uh, if you see like pool reflections of pools, most of that will reflect basically white in the sky. So I'm going to leave that alone. But for, starting from about here on, I'm going to uh, wet everything. And it's okay to go right over what you've painted before. Um, most of that in this paper is not going to lift not terribly because I haven't put down a lot of pigment there and I'm just going to start up here I've got some color in my brush but it's okay it's not enough to worry about just like with the sky on on landscapes uh, where their landscape elements are your main feature you don't want to get carried away with the reflections and this is a, a personal choice, but I don't paint uh, mirror reflections. Mirror reflections actually, I think, are very, very confusing, even in photographs. And they, they're kind of rare. Almost always the water is a little bit disturbed, so that reflections almost always look soft to some degree, may even look broken up depending on whether there's wind or not. But I, I like just the really soft hint of a reflection. And generally, you will only see the tallest parts. There's actually, <laughs> I've seen uh, watercolors actually delve into the geometry of that. I don't mess with any of that. But um, usually you won't see reflections of these really low to the ground foreground elements you'll just see there and i'm going to put some of this let me get a little more blue back here you'll see a little bit of sky color and i'm just gonna brush that in like this it's gonna be very diffused though so there's a little sky blue and then we're going to reflect just some specific shapes, like here. Oh, that is pretty bright. Wow. How did I not know that was that bright? All right, let me go over here to this gray-green. And that's going to soften, continue to creep and soften. And don't worry about, you know, the landform. So we'll take care of that in a minute. Maybe we're catching a little bit of the side. And usually elements that reflect are a little bit grayer than the 
what they're reflecting. It's okay to, to have them be less intense. I think that maybe I overdid it on that reflection. It was very wet, so it's going to creep and diffuse quite a lot. I wouldn't need to use as big a brush as I'm using here. I just, uh, again, I didn't change it from uh, the brush I pre-wet everything, but it's really fine. It's fine. Go up here and grab some of this uh, yellower color. Don't get too mathematical about this. I mean, it's like, oh, that reflection is not quite as tall as that one is. It's like, this is not, you know, it's these things actually look pretty unlike, especially if they're soft, unlike the reality. But I will shorten that one a bit. You know, and that's, for me, that's enough. Uh, it's just enough so you know that's water. And I don't want it to detract from any of this, okay? So very quickly now we're going to get into the detail phase. Uh, and all, all I'm going to do now really is, I, I could really spend a couple hours going through and doing details, but I'm going to show you the, the main ones. I'm going to mix up. And you need, the, this is really the shadow phase. I call it the detail phase, but it is very detailed. But um, let's mix up a, this is red iron oxide and neutral tint. So it's kind of a, that turns it into almost a raw umber or burnt umber. Actually, uh, let me add a little bit of blue to that. I'll keep it even grayer yet okay and i want also a real earthy green so i get this as a green it's green gold here add some neutral tint to that add a little bit of red iron oxide to that warm it up Let's put a little thalo in there. Why not? See how that looks. That's very olivey, so that's what I'm I'm looking for, an olive green. You see what I did there? I just I didn't know how I was gonna mix that color. <laughs> and I kept pushing and pulling it till I got what I wanted, all right? That's totally fine. Totally fine. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. And the first thing I'm going to do is go on these landforms and just add some shadows. Kind of like I did here, wet and wet. I'm getting my hand in that wet. Now, what you don't want to do is go and meticulously outline these. You just want to pat in, you know, spots just to, to kind of give the idea that there's a shadow there. And as a matter of fact, you can go back and soften, you know, quickly rinse out your brush and soften the top edge of it. Maybe even uh, create a very limited local wet and wet spot where you can charge. That's all fine. Um, Going to go back and strengthen some of these shadows, especially down in these little corners here. I also want to uh, add some, you know, some 
form to some of these land forms. So that's just taking that shadow inland a little further where it might dip and then softening the top edge. You can do that very um, broken like this. So you can, it's ground, you know, it's got texture. It's got rocks and patches of this and that. Just want to make sure that where you have light areas on the edge, you leave those so you have some highlight. A nice blender is your finger. If you got a little shape, I use that a lot on little shapes. If I put a little paint shape down sometimes and I, whoop. That's a little very dry. reassuring. <laughs> You've been giving us lots of tips on how to correct your mistakes, how do you how you mix your colors, and we've been talking in the chat how that's very reassuring because you're showing us the actual process. That really yes. helps a lot. Yeah. Good. And what I like to do in this detail phase too is these little. You never have cookie cutter uh, shorelines. You always have like little bits of you know, debris or whatnot sticking out into the water. Make them small, you know, um, just kind of like that. And it sits out, this, you do this after the reflections because it, it, it makes it look like those are reflections because it looks like this is sitting on top of the water. So maybe we add a few little dots there. Grab some of this green. Now see those those reflections are under there. And literally, I could spend another hour doing what I'm doing right now, just fiddling around with this detail. But I mainly just want to get in, you know, the important contrast spots. Let's do those trees, too. Gorgeous. It's turned out super lovely, and it's... I, I can't imagine how we started this from scratch, and it's already this. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm glad, glad it looks good. I'm mixing up a dark, really dark green and we're just going to go in here uh, remember what i said about shadows sink to the bottom of everything in landscape because you're outdoors and your lighting is overhead and i'm just going to tap under some of these boughs uh, also just hit some spots you know where the trunk would be this just gives gives some of this these trees a little dimension I can quickly go in here and some of that's a little stark, but you can quickly rinse out your brush and just spread it a bit. Do you always work with these huge puddles of paints? I do. Um, Almost always. Oh. Yeah. 
it's it helps me get into and that's a great question it helps me uh divide color families or color themes into regions and like i may have within this region about four or five colors i can dip back into and i can like mix into a corner of this region you know, i want to make just this corner over here a little more blue green and um you know you don't want to get into the habit of meticulously mixing up individual colors in little pools you want big bold areas of just all this variety you know that you can go to i could come back to this green and you know set myself up a little section over here that's yellower i have the space to do that so yeah i i almost always paint that way Well, Steve is probably doing the details. Um, I think somebody's asking about this demo on being available on YouTube. Uh, yes, it will be available on YouTube again. For those who haven't followed along, then um, that's a great opportunity for you to rewatch this video. Um, this is, again, a live demo as part of the four-part course for Steve Mitchell's uh, well, of course, I just said that, <laughs> um, <laughs> to master watercolor landscapes. Um, and Steve, for each session, Steve will go over some of the basic landscape elements, such as skies, um, uh, uh, trees. Trees, and yep. Rocks, rock. uh, underbrush, yeah. water reflections. Gorgeous. So um, this whole piece is kind of like sums up the session four. Um, but with a different yeah. piece. Yeah. yeah. The only thing we didn't do here that will be in the course is rocks. I have a little section on rocks. Gorgeous. Yeah, I'm excited for that too. It's like different rocks and different locations have different textures too. So that's really amazing to paint. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Well, Kathleen, I could stop pretty much anywhere now. Um, I could okay. also keep going for another two hours, but I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> gotcha. Well, I, I think, think that's um, the gist. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, that turned out, uh, we can all agree, that turned out pretty amazing than expected. Um, and, well, as expected from you, but, oh, wow, that's satisfying. <laughs> I just have to keep quiet for a while. Hold on. Let me watch that. <laughs> yeah, let me uh, lift the tape too. Ooh. Oh, that's satisfying. Yeah. And the question may be what more would I do to it? Probably just go through and make sure I have shadows deep enough and balanced in the oh i do want to just mention one other thing and that's just uh i usually will put in just some very faint water lines oh yeah and not too many and again that's that's a very and then not too dark either so just just wanted to mention that that just makes that water look a little more interesting and natural. Gorgeous. Thank okay. you so much. See, that was lovely. Uh, apart from those highlight or areas, lines that you've placed, uh, do you also put like ink for white ink, probably for like highlights or not? Necessarily? I, I might. If, uh, for instance, I can't think of a reason to in here unless I wanted like a tree branch or, or a tree <laughs> in the foreground with branches that needed to stand out over a dark background, then I might hear, um, you know, usually it's easy enough in a painting like this to paint around where you want your highlights to go. So uh, basically I would do that as it uh, may obviously be needed, or you could even use gouache, a gel pen, a white gel pen, 
or gouache or something I might use. Gotcha. Yeah, that might be wonderful to add to. Awesome. You guys have great suggestion. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, I think that pretty much wraps it up. There are a lot of wonderful comments in the chat. It's impossible for me to mention all of them, but <laughs> I can assure you that Steve will backtrack through all of these and would appreciate your messages. Um, before we delve deeper into, uh, let me just switch screens. Okay. Before we go to our Q and A, um, we're just gonna quickly talk about the course for those who, for the newcomers and for those who haven't heard about it. Uh, again, it's a four part course. It's going to be on Sundays, 12 p.m. Eastern time, starting November 11th, Saturday. Now, make sure to take note of the time zone changes for some of the areas. So that might uh, affect you. So you, if you don't want to be late with classes, then uh, that's something you should take note of. But if you want to watch the recording as well and you can't attend the live, that's also okay because all of the links to the live classes will be redirected to the main recording page. So no problem. Um, and since this is a four-part session and it's a course, you will also get a chance to um gain feedback from steve after you have taken up the whole classes and the whole course apparently um so we have a live feedback session at the end you get to submit your one of your candidate work so that steve can um critique that and yeah that's gonna be super fun and amazing so i hope you guys join us i can see most of you have expressed your interest in joining already, so thank you so much. Great. Yeah, thank you. That's <laughs> awesome. Okay. We'll I have fun. Clarify. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, we'll have fun. <laughs> that's that's definitely a reassurance, um, and we can guarantee that. Steve can guarantee that. Oh, other direction, I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't been used to this for a while. Uh, let's see. Uh, we can keep looking at this painting or I can bring my face back on, which is not as nice looking. It's, it's okay. I think we can switch back to Steve. I think we want to see the Bob Ross of watercolor landscapes. <laughs> proven to be Bob Ross. <laughs> Let's see. Um, All right. Here I am. Awesome. I think we can answer some questions. Most of those you've answered already in the chat, but if you guys have additional questions, uh, we're going to be accepting uh, questions in the chat. Let's see. Um, just to clarify about the subscription for Etcher. So um, if you have subscribed to Etcher's annual or monthly subscription, any of those you can, you will have access to steve's course so once you've signed up once you are a subscriber you get to access all of the classes and the courses so no question about that once you've signed up you get to access steve's course so um let's see let me just backtrack to that i especially appreciate the slight amount of mid-range detail in that one light area in the middle right above the water line very helpful said Lord. Good, good. <laughs> I think we have some wonderful messages here. Thanks, Steve, for sharing this wonderful preview of the upcoming course. Definitely going to sign up from Country Boardwalk Studios. <laughs> You're very welcome, and thank you. Oh, wonderful comment. I think Lisbeth mentioned, I'm sure I can see a salmon leaping out any second. <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Uh, always a learning experience to watch Steve paint. Thanks for sharing. And I, let's see. Okay, I think we've got wonderful messages earlier. I think there are no more questions. Let us know before we proceed to the giveaway. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna give you some time to drop in your questions while I backtrack through the chat, which you haven't made easier for me, guys, because you have filled in the chat. So bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see there. Okay, invaluable lessons on how to make corrections. I uh, definitely agree with that. I'd love seeing artists make their corrections on the spot. Um, let's see. Okay, I don't think we do have questions. All right. Um, oh, 
A uh, quick question about balance still. Do you use vanishing point to help balance the piece? Not really. Uh, it, you know, vanishing points are great for um, architecture. They're necessary. I'm, you know, I usually I don't mess with that on, especially on a piece like this. Uh, I just try to kind of, you know, guess at the scale, you know, where one tree is further away than, but uh, I do think about the horizon line. So that aspect of uh, perspective theory is important where your horizon line is your eye line. It's not necessarily where you see the ground. So, you know, you have to think about when something looks like it's below the horizon or above the horizon, but you don't really in a painting like this, you don't really need a vanishing point. Gotcha. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry if I wasn't able to catch this earlier, but how much of a slant do you have on your painting or do you always a, have that? Yeah, I'm about a 20 to 30 degree angle. About right now it's about 20. Uh, oh. Some of that I do for video, but also just because I don't like looking down for a long time. Um, I will, however, flatten uh, my piece, uh, maybe put something under it when I want to wash, when I don't want to wash to roll down to the bottom real quick. So it varies. When I'm painting dry, I'm almost always on a, about a 20 to 30 degree angle. That's just really my preference, you know, for yeah. comfort, working comfort. Thank you so much for confirming that. That really helps. Um, let's see. Yeah, I, I'm guessing you've got a lot of subscribers on your channel here because um, they've been expressing how you've helped them tremendously Good. for uh, the past. Yeah, years. we're we're at three hundred thirty-six thousand right now. Well, congratulations! Well, thank you. <laughs> awesome, you guys are amazing too. Minders are great. I love my minders. <laughs> awesome let's see yeah they're definitely here um okay i think that's pretty much it but let me know if i've missed out a question or two so um just feel free to retype them here um but while i'm waiting for those a uh, shout out for steve's uh m grim set uh castle mc <laughs> let's see um all right, so while I'm waiting for other questions in the chat, uh, it, I guess it's time for the giveaway, which you Yay. guys have been so patient to. Um, a minder here. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, what about the giveaway? It's here. All right, so here is the giveaway. You get to win a watercolor. Oh, it's, it's, it's the opposite. <laughs> a watercolor postcard from Etcher. Um, it, this is a tin set. Uh, it's kind of... it's. I made a mistake to put it in a moist area, so it's uh, got some rust there. It's my fault. <laughs> um, but it opens, up, it opens up to a set of watercolor postcards. It's, again, 300 GSM, cold-pressed, and I've painted one already with a, a scene from the Philippines. Um, and there's a postcard at the back where you can write notes. Um, so if you're that kind of person who still loves sending letters to your loved ones, especially Christmas is coming, this might be the perfect gift for it, them. So um, the mechanics... And those are cotton. Those are cotton, aren't they? 100% cotton, I believe. Yep. Yeah. Cotton. Oh, cotton, pa cotton paper, 300 GSM, acid-free. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Um, so the mechanics are simple. So we get to pick one winner today. In this paper, I have written down a number from 1 to 20. So um, once, you don't need to type in anything just yet, but when you see the word go in the chat, when I type go, that's the only time that you'll type in um, the numbers or your guesses. And when I say stop, those are the only um, numbers that I'll be accepting, like the numbers that are above that word. So what you'll need to do is when I say go, I'll give you 15 seconds to type in your lucky guesses in the chat. And then when I type in stop, then we'll go ahead and skim through the chat, which I believe will be a lot of numbers. Um, so the first person who gets the number that is in this paper wins. But if nobody gets the number, then the 
first person who gets the closest um, to this number will win. So, ready? And, oh, okay, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. Awesome. All right. And I think I saw a winner already, you guys. That's a lot. <laughs> okay, I was expecting that. Um, let me see. We've got, let me just confirm the first person who typed the lucky number. I'm going to show it real quick. Okay. It's a post-it. That's why it has a sticky thing. It's number 11 because the first class of Steve will be on November 11th on 12 p.m. Eastern time. So the first person who typed that is Sherry Beringer. Is that right? Um, let me just see if, let me confirm that. Oh, that's a lot of number. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, let me just see, Sherry. There we go. I think it was Sherry. Congratulations, Sherry. I think you were the first person who typed that. Congratulations. Awesome. All right, you're a winner, the lucky winner for our watercolor postcards from Etcher. And hopefully you're going to be able to use this for when you take Steve's course. So that's going to be a fun way to do some yeah. small mini landscapes, your practice landscapes. So congratulations to you and congratulations to everyone. Um, let me just. There we go. Okay. So um, all you need to do is message us at hello at etcherstudio.com um but i got your name right here so um yeah feel free to message us that you are the winner for the live demo of steve mitchell then um uh, we'll go ahead and proceed and talk to you with um, the details on how to send your prize congratulations again and thank you so much everybody for joining us yes, uh, I think thank you everyone Sorry, I think that was a question earlier that I missed. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, unrelated, but I think it's worth asking. Um, I've always, Kim is asking, I've always wondered where you got the handmade ceramic water cup with the edge to hold the brushes in your earlier videos. Oh, yeah. Um, it's a, a ceramicist out in San Francisco. Her name is uh, Eileen Goldenberg, and I believe it's, Goldenberg Designs. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's in several. I have the link in several of my videos, but uh, I think it's uh, it's GoldenbergDesigns.com, I think. So if you, uh, it's like golden, like the color Goldenberg, B-E-R-G, Designs. Um, I think Kathleen's checking it. But I think it's GoldenbergDesigns.com. But she makes uh, a lot of different ceramics and love those bowls. I've, I think I've been using those is. for several years. Yep, I think is she. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think this is it. Let me just go ahead and drop that link to the chat. Great. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Kathleen. You are so much welcome. Oh, great to send family at Christmas. Thank you so much. That's That's really a thoughtful gift to you guys. Um, all right. Thanks for sharing this wonderful fun preview. Awesome. Okay. So I think, uh, yep. Sundays. Oh, okay. Let me just go ahead and see. Am I mistaken? I think it's, oh no, I'm sorry. Saturdays. I think that was Saturdays. Saturdays. Yeah. <laughs> My mistake. Yeah. I am so sorry. Thank you so much for <laughs> pointing that out. <laughs> I've been saying Sundays. Oh my gosh. Uh, November 11th is a Saturday. My yeah. mistake. It's the same time too. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time. And how and where do I message you? That's hello at etcherstudio.com. Uh, sure. Thank you so much uh, via email. Awesome. 
Okay, and I think that's pretty much it for us. I'm going to be dropping some final links in the chat. Um, and while I do that, Steve, do you have any final thoughts, uh, words of inspiration for us before we close no, the session? No, uh, not really. Just get out your paints and give it a try. Have fun with it. Just Super try, exciting. try, try. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, sure. And I cannot emphasize how inspiring this demo was and oh, good. thank you <laughs> that's always good to hear thank you so much everybody for sticking with us till the end um definitely and thank you so much steve um for really just an amazing teacher today My um pleasure. and for gracing uh, our saturday our sunday for others um so thank you so much everybody and we'll see you there and until next time everybody make more art bye everyone Bye-bye.